UFO was Jerry Anderson's first fully live-action television series. After more than a decade spent producing shows with puppets, the series entered production in 1969, but was set in the then future of 1980, as aliens from a distant planet began harvesting human organs for use in transplant surgery to keep their own failing bodies alive. Shadow, a top-secret international organization with their headquarters beneath a film studio in England, is established to combat the alien threat. But will even the best of the best be enough to deter the continual visits from the aliens? The first signs of an incoming UFO are usually picked up by the orbiting supersatellite SID. This is Space Intruder Detector. Shadow's moon base will then scramble interceptors to destroy the intruder. And once all three of them have missed the target, the next line of defense is often Skydiver 1, one of a fleet of Skydiver submarines on permanent standby around the world. As the UFO enters the atmosphere, Sky 1 is launched to seek and destroy it. But should the UFO still somehow make a landing on Earth, conveniently usually not too far from Shadow Headquarters, then it's up to Shadow Ground Forces to close in with the mobiles. But sometimes the aliens can still sneak through undetected, and Shadow will need to keep their wits about them as they face threats the likes of which they cannot imagine. Now don't panic, Alec. Despite all these star vehicles, which allowed for stories set on land, in space, or under the sea, the show also included a wide cast of regular and recurring characters, with Ed Bishop's driven and determined Commander Straker proving to be one of the greatest character studies ever seen in any Jerry Anderson series. Despite often seeming cold and calculating, audiences soon got to see the vulnerable and flawed human being he really was and several episodes focused on the personal cost Straker had had to pay in order to keep the Shadow organization functioning. Look, it's pretty quiet here. There's nothing you can do. Why don't you go home? What home? In addition to fleshing out the personal lives of Straker and many of the show's guest characters, the series also allowed the organ-harvesting aliens themselves to be presented as tragic figures on more than one occasion. Our planet is dying. Our national resources are exhausted. We must come to Earth to survive! UFO also wasn't afraid to touch on issues like sexism and racism, even if some of its efforts must have seemed hopelessly naive even at the time. Racial prejudice burned itself out five years ago. Particularly when the show sometimes undermined its own message by placing women in positions of authority and then having the men around them act like rejects from a carry-on film. I think your equipment is fabulous, but uh, I am familiar with it. And no, we don't know what the purple wigs are about either. Following the completion of the first 17 episodes, UFO took a break in production with the closure of MGM Borumwood, the studio where this series was being made. Nine months later, production resumed at Pinewood Studios, but since they weren't under contract, many of the cast had moved on to other work and were thus unavailable to return to the series. This led to the sudden and unexplained disappearance of many of the show's regular characters. But since the episodes were shown in a largely random order anyway, this wasn't as distracting as it might otherwise have been. Wanda Ventham returned from the first episode to fill the void left by the departure of George Sewell, and other returning cast members would fill vacant slots as needed. For its final nine episodes, UFO became a noticeably slicker and faster-paced production than it had previously been, with Commander Straker usually finding himself at the very center of the action and pushed beyond breaking point on more than one occasion. Most of the padding that had slowed down the earliest episodes was gone, and even the original concept of the aliens themselves was refined still further, with the chilling prospect that they may need more than just human body parts to survive. They may have no physical being at all, and therefore need a vehicle, a container, our bodies. 
Although some schedulers had trouble working out exactly which age group the series was aimed at, the hardware suggested a family audience similar to those of Anderson's previous series, but the sexual and violent elements of the show's stories were clearly unsuitable for children, UFO won a strong fan following and proved successful in the ratings, particularly in the all-important American markets of New York and Los Angeles. A second season was quickly commissioned, and work was already well underway when a sudden drop in UFO's ratings led to the premature cancellation of UFO 2. Everything was going to be better, and we were poised for that, and to not be able to realize it was a deep, deep disappointment. It took me a long time to get over that. Despite this major setback, Anderson still felt that the work that had already been done on the second season could be salvaged by reworking the UFO 2 concept into an entirely new series. But that's another story. Here we go again. Almost 50 years after it first aired, the 26 episodes of UFO continue to enjoy repeat screenings around the world, and the show has recently gained a new lease of life in high definition. It is a series that continues to enthrall new audiences by defying their expectations. The show's bright visual style and jazzy opening titles are completely at odds with the tone of the stories it tells and its main characters are often forced to become as ruthless as the desperate enemies they're fighting in order to protect the planet. Rumours of a revival have continued to persist for many years, with some critics now viewing the series as a British precursor to such shows as The X-Files and Fringe, which only proves once again how Anderson and his team were frequently ahead of their time with their ideas. Is this the end or the beginning? Whether or not we ever see a new 21st century incarnation of UFO, it looks like Earth of the 1980s will always be protected by Commander Straker and Shadow. I'll tell you how it's going to be.